That's okay. So the other speakers that we've heard from today are all here to talk about what turns us on. I'm actually here today to talk about what turns us off. So in other words, what we do during our day and how that influences our ability to turn off or sleep at night. So just a quick show of hands. How many people here feel tired right now? Yeah, <laughs> me too. Um, chances are if I had asked that question when we first arrived this morning, I may have even seen some more hands go up. So when I survey my first year undergrad class at the University of Guelph, more than 90% of them report feeling tired either some or most of the time. So what I'm hoping to do today is to talk to you about why I think that is such a huge problem. And it's something that we really need to start doing something about. So a couple of years ago, in 2015, the National Sleep Foundation released updated guidelines in terms of how much sleep we need every single night based on our age. So I think most of us in this room probably fall into the young adult or the adult range. And you can see here in the blue that it's recommended that we get somewhere in between seven to nine hours of sleep every single night. For the first time, and I think somewhat impressively, they've also included the data in these turquoise areas, and that represents the amount of sleep that may be appropriate. So for the first time, acknowledging that our individual sleep needs do vary, and they vary based on both genetic and environmental factors. But by and large, we need seven to nine hours of sleep every single night. So those are our sleep requirements. How do they compare with our sleep realities? Well, we see pretty quickly that they don't line up. So this is data from 2012, showing that almost 50% of the adult population is getting less than seven hours of sleep every night. So that means almost half of all adults are sleep deprived. So how did we get here? How did we, as a modern day society, become so damn tired? I personally believe it has a lot to do with this guy. So for those of you who don't recognize him, this is Thomas Edison, who famously invented the light bulb back in 1879. An invention that would have enormous implications for all of humanity. Now, before the invention of the light bulb, and even arguably the Industrial Revolution, humans used to more or less go to bed when the sun went down and wake up in the morning when the sun rose. So we really used to let these sort of natural dark, uh, light dark cycles sort of dictate what time we go to bed at and how long we would sleep for. And it turns out we did so for a very good reason. And that is that light is the strongest regulator of our biological clocks and circadian rhythms. So in the presence of light, a region in our brain in the hypothalamus called the suprachiasmatic nucleus, yes, it's a mouthful, so SCN for short, sends an inhibitory signal to the pineal gland. And that gland is what's responsible for producing melatonin, our sleep hormone, the hormone that tells us it's time to go to sleep. So in the presence of light, our brains are being told, don't produce any melatonin, we need to stay awake right now. But then in the dark, or the absence of light, we have this sort of free production of melatonin in the brain, circulates through our bodies, and it tells us it's time to go to sleep. So when the sun would rise in the morning, melatonin would shut off. When the sun set in the evening, melatonin would increase, telling us to go to sleep. Welcome to life after the Industrial Revolution. <laughs> and more specifically, welcome to 2017. We've got smartphones, we've got laptops, we've got you know, lamps on our, on our nightstands, we've got e-readers. All of these devices emit light. So when you're lying in bed at night binge, uh, binging on Netflix, the light from the screen of your laptop or whatever you're watching it on is telling your brain, don't produce any melatonin. We need to stay awake right now. And so we let these sort of artificial forms of light prolong our day. We no longer listen to the natural light-dark cycles that are set forth by the sun. So this leads to a pretty serious consequence, and what I think is probably one of the most undervalued uh, health concerns of today, and that's called a condition of social jet lag. How many people have heard of this before? 
Yeah, one or two. So yeah, not well known at all. Um, so it is a term that is coined by a researcher out of Munich. Um, his name is Till Ronenberg. And it simply means the misalignment of one's social and biological clocks. So your social clock, whether it's work, school, a TEDx event, might be telling you that you need to be somewhere at 8 o'clock in the morning. But then your biological clock, your internal clock, is saying, no, 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 we were up late watching Netflix last night, we should still be sleeping. And so this sort of social jet lag builds up throughout our weeks, right? All Monday through Friday, we're just we're suffering from this social jet lag. We might be using things like coffee to help get us through. And then Saturday arrives. Glorious, glorious Saturday. And we allow ourselves to sleep in, to recover a little bit from the social jet lag that we've accrued throughout the week. But then all of a sudden, it's Monday morning again, and that alarm goes off at 6 a.m. or 7 a.m., and the cycle continues. So there are some really obvious consequences of this. Um, tiredness, maybe moodiness, inability to remember things, um, concentration problems. But it turns out that there's much more serious consequences as well. So lack of sleep has been associated with obesity, type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, all sorts of other metabolic conditions as well. And you might ask why. Well, the explanation is quite multifactorial. If you are sleeping less, that means you're awake more and more likely to be eating more. Sleep debt also disrupts the leptin-ghrelin axis, which are important hormones for satiety, controlling your appetite. Lack of sleep not only makes you more hungry, but it actually changes your food preferences. You're more likely to grab something that's calorically dense, high fat, as opposed to, you know, that salad. Very new and interesting research coming out is actually showing that lack of sleep is actually able to change the microbiome of our guts, predisposing us to obesity. Not only are there serious health concerns, there is a very strong correlation between sleep and academic performance. And that is not only in high school students, but in university students and college students as well. The amount of sleep that you get is a strong predictor of how well you'll perform. And in response to this, some of the schools, even in Toronto, are actually setting the start time of schools back a little bit to allow the students to sleep in a little bit longer so that they feel more rejuvenated when they get to school, and they're seeing huge increases in their test scores. So big, big problems with lack of sleep. So we have a problem on our hands. We need seven to nine hours of sleep every single night, and we are simply not getting it. So, what do we do? Well, I think the most obvious solution would be to unplug. Stop watching Netflix into the wee hours of the morning. Um, you know, meditate in a dark room before going to bed. While this is probably the most logical and easiest solution, I'm also aware that it's probably the least practical. <laughs> um, so there's other things we can do too. We can use programs called Flux on your laptops that will actually modify the amount of light being produced from those devices in accordance with time of day. You could invest in a super sexy pair of blue light blocking goggles like these that you can actually wear when you're watching your laptop. And they block blue light, which is the type of light that suppresses melatonin the most. They make everything look orange. You could try to strategically expose yourself to natural light during the day. Take a hike when it's sunny out. You know, use artificial lighting inside uh, during the day when it's not sunny out. Use bright light therapy, those types of things. But no matter what we do, I think we really need to start making sleep a priority. We need to prioritize our ability to turn off. We need to take sleep seriously. We need to respect its importance and its value to our lives. So, I work for the Department of Human Health and Nutritional Sciences here at the University of Guelph. We teach and we research lifestyle factors and their relation to overall health. For the past 30, 40, even 50 years, there has been a huge emphasis on the role that nutrition and exercise have to play on the overall health of the, of the individual. And it's really not until maybe the last five, six, seven years that we're beginning to appreciate the role that sleep may have to play here as well. I personally believe that sleep is as important as nutrition and physical activity 
to our overall health. I wanted to leave us with a quote here today, that we are not much sicker and much madder than we are is due exclusively to that most blessed and blessing of all natural graces, sleep. Thank you.